into LTE advanced and subsequent releases of the LTE advanced. So which are still in place right now. In fact, in many places in India, we still have the original LTE itself. Uh, LTE advanced features are still being implemented. Uh, this was all the pre 5G era, basically. So that's why there is this arrow, slant arrow here, telling about the evolution, uh, where we evolved from LTE advanced to the 5G new, ra new radio. So that is the evolution graph. Also, but what you can see is there is an additional arrow here, which is horizontal and it's called the revolution. So why is 5G a revolution? That's because until LTE time frame, nobody thought that there will be a lot of uh, devices. That is uh, Internet of Things sort of scenario where they have to host a lot of devices, massive connectivity, and they have to uh, run QoS or quality of services which are extremely diverse in nature. So LTE was mostly doing broadband connectivity. Like the aim was to provide best video services to most of the users. But uh, the 5G was very, very diverse. So that's why many people call the 5G part as not only just the evolution, but it's also a revolution because again, 5G is the first standard which supports both broadband as well as IoT through standardized mechanisms. So now people, when they did IoT initially, they used to use some proprietary standards like LoRa, Sigfox. You might also have such uh, modules in your uh, institutes where uh, people code on Arduino, connect a LoRa module or connect a Sigfox module and do some small IoT application. But this will not be scalable if you have to take it at a global level. So that's why standardization is required even for IoT and the 5G in our standard helps in standardizing even the IoT procedures. So that's how the 5G NR standard evolved. So obviously, since it has evolved from 4G, that is the LTE, it has a lot of its footprint in 4G. So that's why I'll briefly discuss the terminology in 4G because the exact same terminology is used in 5G also. So before we move there, let's, let's briefly discuss what 4G LTE already achieves. So it already gives the best of the original 3D, 3G standards, that is UMTS and CDMA. It gives data rates of around 300 Mbps in the downlink and 75 Mbps in the uplink. It can support voice as data. That is, that's why you have this voice over LTE, VO LTE. You might have seen those symbols on your mobile phones sometimes. And you have uh, multimedia video conferencing support. And it has flexible bandwidth from 1.4 megahertz up to 20 megahertz. It supports MIMO and IP based interfaces. Interestingly, it supports something called inter access technology handoff. That is, if you are on an LTE call, especially voice call, if the LTE 4G signal is dropping, then you can always hand off to the 3G or even the 2G technology so that your call drop does not happen. And since it is across access technologies, it's called inter access technology handoff. And LTE has two modes, the TDD and the FTD modes. In TDD, both uplink and downlink use the same frequency. In FTD, they operate on different frequencies. So this is a brief of LTE. Now, everything here is carried forward even in 5G NR. That's why I have quite a few slides on NTE because there is a lot of overlap between LTE and 5G NR. All the features here, are either supported at least in the way the LTE supports or in a better way in 5G NR. So quickly speaking about the access technologies in LTE, they, ha they have uh, been divided into two categories. The downlink uses orthogonal frequency division multiple access, which is very standard and we have been using this uh, even in uh, say WiMAX, which was preceding LTE. And uh, OFDMA was a proven concept long ago, but it came into practice very recently because of the power you can uh, embed inside a chipset. So amount of power, processing power you can have now is much greater than what you could have 20 years ago. So even though OFDM was there from the 1960s, it could not have been implemented unless the processors had enough power to do it. Now that the processors have all this power, we are able to implement OFDMA in the uh, downlink in LTE. Uplink uses something called SCFDMA. I have a slide on this later. 
So as you can see, OFDMA has orthogonal narrow subcarriers like this. SCFDMA overall, it looks like this. Somebody uses, is using a wide subcarrier. Each user is using the wide subcarrier. Overall, it looks like this. How we, in, in actually in place, we are using these narrow subcarriers only. How the final transmission looks like this wide subcarrier transmission, that's because we have an additional DFT here, which I'll explain a few slides later. Uh, any questions up to this point? So what we can do is we can take questions in between so that there is no confusion as we move to the uh, slides further. So if you people have any questions at this point, please let me know. Or any time during my presentation, if you have questions, please let me know. Yeah, Venkatesh, you have a question. You have raised your hand. Sir, uh, rough one, sir. one basic question. Yeah. Uh, 4G and LT are entirely different or uh, same? Yeah, they are actually synonymous. So 4, 4G is again generation of uh, mobile communication. What has happened is LTE has grown to be the biggest 4G standard. There were other attempts at it using WiMAX or extending WiMAX uh, beyond it. WiMAX had two flavors, 16D and 16E. Uh, they tried to extend it and make it a 4G technology, but it didn't fly so well. So right now when somebody says it's 4G, I would say 99% of the time they are referring to LTE. So they have become synonymous now. Did that answer your question? Thank you, sir. So in the same way, 5G also has a lot of things, but slowly 5G now is becoming uh, 5G NR. Navin, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. One more question. Ranjan, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, is it uh, correct to say that uh, we have WCDMA technology in uh, 4G? Uh, it, it is it is there, but uh, again, the extensions to 4G and WCDMA are minimal. So what they had done for 3G itself, they are having some more MIMO support and all. But as I told, uh, a representative technology for 4G is LTE itself. So there are many 4G standards that way, as I told you. Uh, even and the thing that is, uh, is, it is like uh, means uh, uh, although we have the dedicated protocols or standards for 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, but yeah. in our India, when we say uh, the deployment part, uh, then we uh, we do not have the dedicated uh, 4G and uh, dedicated 3G uh, equipment installed on the site. No, See, I, most of the time when we claim that uh, we have 3G technology with us, but I I didn't uh, find uh, the Cures also uh, 3G BTSs install in our country. So that's why my question is like uh, uh, when you just say that uh, the 4G is equivalent to LTE network. So mm -hmm. I think uh, is it pure LTE network or the WCDMA extension we get? No, no, no. It's the pure LTE network. So uh, most of them, see, you might be telling about the operational band. See, operational band can be shared. Between three, no, no, I'm not years talking years. about the operational band. I'm talking about the hardware which has, which is, which is required Correct. to deploy this. Yes, yes, uh, it's a different thing. hardware. Because this, they will have a different hardware for LTE. Basically, it's like this: if your base station comes as a board, let's say that's like an FPGA plus a DSP board. If your base station comes in that manner, you will have a separate board for your LTE base station, which is not running any WCDMA on it as of now. However, the operator can provide what I told as that inter access technology operation. That is, if a call or if a data is requested through your 4G base station, if the 4G base station is not able to provide service, it can transfer that to the 3G so that the 3G base station can provide the service. So it can coexist with the 3G base station. But if your question is, we are we using new hardware? Definitely yes. For LTE, we are using new hardware. So it means uh, we can say that the LTE is a uniform network, but when we say WCDMA, then it is requires a different type of gateways for interconnectivity and all. Uh, not at the gate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the protocols used by the gateways, yes. So physical devices need not change. The protocol changes. So for example, oh. it's like this. You might have a gateway which is supporting 3G right, right now. If I open up that device and replace the 3G chipset with the 4G chipset, it will start using the 4G, 4G protocols. So the change is okay, mostly okay. in the chipset, basically. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. 
I mean, please feel free to ask all these questions that will make this uh, entire session very fruitful. Yeah, yes. Uh, so, Kura, yes, please go ahead. Uh, sir, good morning. Good, good afternoon, sir. This is Upendra. Kura Upendra. And, uh, sir, uh, I am doing research in spectrum sensing. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, actually, here, uh, my, uh, my aim is, okay, due to uh, this uh, PAPR, right In interference will occur that means uh, uh, if the papr is more interference will be more so that uh, uh, sensing the spectrum is more critical so okay. uh, i have used i have used the uh, pts method and i have reduced the papr uh, one of my question is um, yeah, this is the professor has asked the question why SEF, why you are using PTS method rather than SEF DMA method? Okay, so that's a very specific question. So, what we can tell is uh, uh, when you want to answer why one method is better than the other, you will have to show it the performance comparison. So, what, what I can tell uh, immediately is See, compared to OFDMA, SCFDMA already has a reduced PAPR. Uh, as I told you, I have a slide, uh, two, three slides later, because SCFDMA uses a DFT block before it uses the IFFT block. So we all know that in OFDMA, there is an IFFT block, which, which will actually generate the time domain OFDMA signal, right? So yes. now in SCFDMA, there is a smaller size DFT block, which is preceding this IFFT block. What that DFT block does is, again, as we know, DFT will put a particular component on, it will share the information on different uh, carriers, right? So if I give input to the DFT as one signal, the output will be shared on all the output ports, correct? So that will yes. kind of divide the power and uh, make kind of average out the signal, okay? Yeah. So rough, that because of that operation, it reduces the PAPR. Now, yes. uh, I'm not familiar with the method you have used, that PTS method or something. I'm that not is partial important. transmit sequence, sir. PAPR. Partial transmit. Oh, okay, okay. So, you are, I, I, yeah, I got the method. So, you are now using partial transmit sequences. So, that is also one way to reduce PAPR. But each yeah. one has its advantage and disadvantage. See, FCFDMA, you need not compromise on the sequence length. You can still send the entire sequence. Uh, partial transmit okay. sequence, you will have to send you have to divide the actual sequence into multiple small parts and send because you are making it as small parts, PAPR will reduce. But now it is also more information for the base station, right? That you should tell these are the number of parts, take, stitch yeah. them together later and so on, right? Yes. Yes, so that overhead will reduce with SCFDMA. But uh, directly one cannot tell whether the PAPR given by partial transmission will always be more or always be less than SCFDMA. It again depends on the information that you are sending. Okay, yes. so both methods can be beneficial depending on your application. However, in terms of standardization, SCFDMA is a standardized method. Maybe that is why your professor is asking you to compare it with the standardized method. Because this is yes. typical in research. We come up with some new method. You have to compare it with the benchmark, right? So that yeah, benchmark yeah. can be SCFDMA when you want to compare. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, here SEFDMA can be used only in uplink. Why? Because power consumption is a factor for user equipment. Yes, it, it can be used in downlink, but uh, as you told, uh, base station transmit power, we have a constant power source there. They are plugged into a generator. Or most of the time, they have, a, they have enough power with them. That's why we yes. use it only for uplink, which are uh, more power constrained. Okay, so maybe because it's the benchmark scheme, your professor has asked you to compare whatever you have with the benchmark scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sir. is the only way we can tell our method is better, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, understood. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So if there are uh, no more questions, I'll just continue. Maybe I'll no, no, just... uh, Yes, sir, please continue. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so now that we know about these access methods, let's quickly look at the different bandwidth supported by LTE. No need to remember this table or anything. It's just here to show that LTE supports various bandwidths. But common thing is, regardless of whatever bandwidth you have, the frame duration is always 10 milliseconds. Subframe duration is always 1 millisecond. 
and the subcarrier spacing is always 15 kilohertz for data. Uh, there are some special signals like uh, random access signals which may use a lower subcarrier spacing, but most of the cases the subcarrier spacing is 15 kilohertz in LTE. But of course, depending on the bandwidth, the F50 size changes from being 128.50 up to 2048.50. Uh, remaining things are not so necessary. Uh, so this is the main thing I wanted to convey through this slide. Uh, now let me move to the different physical air channels in LTE. All these numbers that I have shown in LTE equally hold for 5G NR. That is why these are present. I keep repeating, repeating it again and again because you should not think that the talk is on 5G NR, but we are learning LTE because these are the common aspects. That's why they are there. Whatever is different, I'll cover them anyway. So the main physical layer channels in LTE are synchronization channels, broadcast channels, control channel, and data channel. This is mostly in downlink. I have left out the uplink so because it will be too much data. So like. Uh, Control channel, you can have both downlink control channel and uplink control channel. Similarly, data channel, you can have downlink data channel as well as uplink data channel. Synchronization. And there is a broadcast channel called PBCH. Okay. Now, same channels exist in 5G NR also, but their structure is different. The kind of sequences they use may be different. The way it is transmitted may be different. Okay, I'll discuss those aspects soon. Yeah. Okay, let's. So if you see an FTD frame in LTE, right? This is how it will look like. Basically, a frame consists of multiple subframes. Okay, and each subframe is one millisecond long. And there is one more unit thing called slot. Each slot is 0.5 milliseconds long. So obviously one radio frame consists of 20 slots. That's why they are numbered 0, 1, up to 19. So 20 slots form a radio frame, out of which two slots form a subframe. Okay. Then inside a subframe, you will have multiple symbols. So if it's normal CP, you will have 14 symbols and the first symbol in each slot is slightly longer than the remaining symbols. So these are some minute details which are very important because uh, in, in LTE, every first symbol of a slot, right? It has a different CP length. It has a 160 samples length CP if your FFT size is 2048 and remaining sample remaining symbols have CP length 144. This difference is there because finally, when you choose a sampling rate, you should get uh, this uh, 30,720 samples in one second. So in order to make sure that you get exactly these many samples, that the CP length does not get equally divided by 14, unfortunately. So what they did was first symbol of each slot, they made it slightly longer. Remaining symbols, they retained the same length. Okay, so that is why you have 66.7 microseconds as the symbol time. Okay, timing wise, all these are same because see, your sampling rate may change, your FFT size may change, but one symbol means it's always 66.7 microseconds, and the CP is always 4.7 microseconds, except for the first symbol on each slot, which will be 5.2 microseconds. Okay. So if, if everything is clear up to this in time domain, I look, I'll proceed further and say how it looks in frequency domain. So in frequency domain, the grid looks like this. So actually we call it a time frequency grid. So basically first half is one slot, second half is another slot. Okay. And what you see here is something called a PRB pair, physical resource block pair. In LTE, this is defined as 12 subcarriers by one symbol. So 12 subcarriers oh sorry, by one subframe. That is 14 symbols in the case of normal CP. Okay. So that's why on the Y axis you have 12, and then on the X axis you have 7 plus 7, 14. 
why this is important is because whenever a user is given some data, this is the smallest amount of resource that a user can take. So you might read theoretical papers where one user got only one subcarrier, okay, or two subcarriers. But the standard says I cannot give a user anything less than 12 subcarriers. Okay, so many resource allocation papers. That's why the more recent ones say that let's assume that a one PRB, the minimum allocation unit is a PRB pair. PRB pair means it gives 12 subcarriers for each user. Okay, spanning one subframe. This is the minimum amount of resource allocation. And you see these R's here, right? R here is the pilot signal. So why do we need pilot signals? We need to do channel estimation at the UE, right? We don't know what is the channel between the base station and the mobile station. That is the most difficult thing in wireless communication, not knowing the channel and trying to estimate the channel. So to assist in channel estimation, we have this reference signals sent by the base station. This is a one antenna base station. That is why it is sending reference signals like this. If it's a two antenna base station, the second ref antenna's reference signal will come at some other subcarriers. Okay. So that is why this is how the time frequency grid looks like in LDE. Uh, any questions up to this point? Uh, no interruption from the participants. Uh, I mean. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's move to the downlink subframe now. So I just have three, four more slides. I think five more slides on LTE and after that we'll come to 5G. We can draw parallels very easily. So see, this is how a typical downlink frame looks like. As I have written here, there are nine or uh, 10 subframes and this gray colored region is the control channel in the downlink, PDCCH. Synchronization and broadcast signals always come on so uh, broadcast comes only on subframe zero. Synchronization comes on subframe zero and five. Okay, that is PSS, SSS. They come on both zero and five. That means their periodicity is every five milliseconds. While control channel comes in every subframe, data can come in multiple subframes. Okay, so here I have shown some data called a paging message. Paging message means uh, you are it's a message coming to your device asking you to wake up because you might have some data in the subsequent frames. OK, this is a very specific message to you telling wake up, wake up. Now you might get a call within the next three milliseconds and so on. OK. So the paging message is a very special message. It always comes in subframe 0, 4, 5 and 9. So this is an example downlink frame in LTE. OK, now. What does downlink transmission use in terms of the physical layer? We know it uses OFDMA, but before that, what kind of modulation it supports? Uh, what kind of code coding, channel coding it supports? That's what we are seeing in this slide now. So whatever data you want to send is given by a terminology called transport block. OK, if this is the same in 5G again. You have a transport block that the data which comes to physical layer is called transport block. On that block, you add a CRC. Okay, typically you add a 24 bit CRC. Sometimes you even add a 40 bit CRC and all, but typically it's 24 bit CRC. Okay, you add the CRC on top of the transport block. Then you do the channel coding or the error correction coding. So, again, depending on the channel, so downlink synchronization signals are sequences. Otherwise, you have the control channel and the data channel, right? So, the control channel uses normal convolutional coding. It's called tail biting convolutional code to be specific and the data channel uses CTC convolution turbo codes. So you do that. You do some scrambling. Then you do modulation in downlink. It supports QPSK 16 QAM 64 QAM. Now they have added support even for 256 QAM. They are also thinking of standardizing 1024 QAM also, but most of the uh, modulation schemes are between QPSK 16 QAM and 64 QAM. They support these three modulation schemes. Then you map it to the different subcarriers and do OFDMA. This is how you do downlink data transmission in LTE. Okay. Now, if you ask me what is it, what is so different in 5G? It's the same sequence. Maybe you will not use convolution code for channel coding. You will use some other code. 
Okay. So again, the entire sequence is same for both 5G and LTE. The specifics of the coding, the specifics of the modulation may change. Otherwise, the chain is the same. Okay. So now let's think what happens to a LTE mobile station when it wakes up. Okay, so your phone has been switched off for a day. You charge the battery, you switch on the phone again. What is the first thing that happens? So first thing your 4G phone does is it synchronizes, it synchronizes with the base station by detecting the PSS and the SSS. Now you might ask how many such PSS can be possible? How many such SSS are, can be possible? So the standard says there can be three PSS and 168 SSS. So totally the, the device has to try all the 504 combinations, three into 168. They, has, they have to try all the 504 combinations. Whichever combination gave you the best result, it thinks that this is the base station which I'll be able to communicate with. Okay. So it chooses the base station based on the PSS SSS combination it detected. Okay. Once it finds the base station, it will send a message to the base station telling, hey, base station, I am here, give me access. So that is called random access. It will send some sequence and tell the base station, I want to communicate, give me data access. Then base station sends a response telling, okay, I have detected you. Why don't you send your data in this particular PRB? Mm -hmm. So base station controls. So you as a user cannot decide, this is where I'll send my data. Base station completely controls where you have to send your data. So it sends the base station gives you that time frequency grid. You will go there transmit your data and that's it. That's how your connection gets established. Okay. Mobile has to decode that allocation message as where it has to transmit the data and then it will transmit the data. There. Okay. So you may think this is all very big, but this entire thing, the limit given by the standard is it should be done within eight milliseconds. Okay. Definitely by 10 milliseconds, most of this, all of this will be done. Your connection connection establishment will be done within 10 milliseconds. After the synchronization that is so from requesting the base station to transmit to here. This will get done very quickly. Synchronization itself may take a few milliseconds, 80 to 100 milliseconds sometimes. So this entire operation that is you switching on your phone to you getting signal and trying to browse a newspaper. Let's say all this happens within half a second. Okay, that's why as a user, you won't feel like there is a huge delay. But in terms of the work your mobile does, it does a lot of work within that half a second. Okay. Uh, so if this is clear, I'll move to the next mode. Next mode is our most favorite mode. This is what most of your phones will be doing. Something called sleep and wake up. Okay, so whenever you are not using your mobile phone, it's actually not communicating any data. You, you may think, think that only the screen is off or regardless of whether your screen is off or screen is on, if you have not used your 4G LTE signal at all, right? But your that uh, data is on, but you are not using any data. Automatically, the protocol puts you to sleep, okay? So your, mob, your mobile device goes into sleep so that it can save power and periodically it will wake up to see whether I have some data, whether base station has sent some data. So how will it know that it has some data? Remember, we have that paging message. So base, base station would have scheduled every, uh, say, 1.24 uh, or like 10.24 seconds, you wake up, see if there is a paging for you. So every 10.24 seconds you wake up, you see whether there is a paging for you. If there is no page for you, you will say, OK, I don't have any data, I'll sleep now. OK. But one main thing is because you are sleeping or the radio is sleeping, the clocks may drift, right? You are maintaining some timing, but your clock may drift. So that's why you will have to resynchronize with the BS by again detecting the uh, primary and secondary synchronization signals. So, but now you need not detect all 504. You know which base station you are talking to. So you can just check with one combination. So you resynchronize, you check for paging. If paging says no data, you go back to sleep. If paging says yes, you have data, then you remain woken up to 
get that data okay so this is how your mobile works basically imagine if you didn't have this sleep and wake up mode believe me your batteries wouldn't have lasted even one hour if you are using 4g okay because if your radio is on for a continuous amount of time the amount of power it drains is very huge okay yeah uh, so i think one and yeah just two slides more on the ld uplink and then we are done with the background for understanding 5g and that so now like how the downlink frame is there this is the uplink frame what you can see mainly here is still it is 14 symbols uh, you have some uh, data symbols you have some pilot symbols but pilot symbols in downlink they were kind of uh, sporadic right as in they were spread around very few pilot symbols here and there you are having now you have one full symbol dedicated for pilot in each slot the middle symbol for each slot is a pilot so can anyone guess why we have to send so many pilots in uplink but so much, so less in downlink so uh, if, you have... if anyone would like to answer please raise your hand the question is very simple downlink we had very few pilots uplink you are sending more pilots if you remember what i told the use of pilot is then you will immediately answer it yeah venkatesh kumar go ahead yeah venkatesh you can unmute and answer is it on data rate sir based on data rate yeah or to some extent yes because the data rate required in uplink is smaller than data rate required in downlink so you can offer to have more pilots correct also because uh, see base station uh, in the downlink it's like base station is trying to do multicast sort of thing that is it is trying to send signals to lot of users at the same time however when particular users are sending their own signals each one could have adopted different modulation schemes each one's channel could be entirely different right as in the channel for user 1 might be entirely different than channel for user 2 and as a user i want to make sure that the base station estimates my channel very well so if i have more pilots then the best base station can estimate my channel very well right so be because of this reason you tend to send more pilots in the uplink so that you can ensure a better channel estimation at the base station also base station is a more complicated device right it can do lot of it can implement lot of fancy algorithms for channel estimation but as a user equipment as a mobile device you are mostly a very low complexity device even if base station sent you lot of pilots you don't want to waste your processing power just to uh, do the estimation using these pilots because maybe these many pilots are sufficient for you to estimate the spread pilots however in uplink you have this luxury that we can send lot of pilots make base station do very good channel estimation okay so finally this is how the uplink transmission looks like very similar to downlink you have channel coding rate matching which is like instead of using uh, again in uplink in lt it uses convolution turbo codes itself okay then it does interleaving scrambling only big changes there is this dft spreading before ofdm together these two form the scfdma okay the dft spreading and the ofdm together they form a scfdma access scheme uh, as i explained before to one of the participants what this dft does is the signal coming as input to the dft gets averaged after you move it to the uh, dft pass it through the dft so its peak to average ratio will already be controlled and again when you do ifft the peak to average ratio reduces when you compare it compare it with only ofdm systems okay and one 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 more subtle thing is in, in uplink they do something called this half sub carrier shift that is you don't transmit any data at dc at exactly zero frequency you shift the sub carriers by half of the sub carrier spacing that is 7.5 kilohertz because sub carrier spacing is 15 kilohertz so you do that shift of you do that shift because again 
uh, low complexity or low cost power amplifiers, if you want to have zero IF there, that is zero intermediate frequency there, then they tend to put some noise around the zero. So in order to avoid such problems, you would kind of take the zero frequency out of the equation and you shift the subcarrier by half the subcarrier spacing. Okay, these are some minute details. Uh, otherwise, if you remember this flow, it's more than enough. Okay, so now we know so much about 4G LTE, all the basic terminology, etc. See, even all this PUSCH, this is physical uplink shared data channel and so on. Okay, now when I come to 5G, I think things will be very easy for you because if you know all this, 5G will just have, for example, if it's PUSCH in LTE, 5G will have NRPUSCH as the equivalent channel. Okay. So everything gets prefixed by NR and maybe the way you, the, it may not use conversion turbo code, it will use some other code and so on. Okay. It's that simple. So if you know this much details in LTE, anything in 5G becomes very simple. Okay. So let's move to why do we need 5G compared to 4G, which I kind of answered at the beginning of the talk. So typically the 4G was caring about only this part. That is enhanced mobile broadband. You have to give very high data rate. You have to give, you have to have very good capacity, very good special spectral efficiency. You should support mobility. This was the main purpose of the mobile standard evolution or the wireless standard evolution, right? Now with the advent of internet of things, these two new things got added to the wireless networks as such. One is called the massive machine type communication and another one is called ultra reliable low latency communication. So see, this is also an IOT thing. A URLLC is also an IOT thing. So strictly speaking, 5G is more of an IOT standard than a broadband standard because two out of three are IOT related things. Only one out of three is a broadband related thing. Okay. So that's why 5G is a revolutionary standard because it's the first standard supporting the IoT evolution. Okay. And I'll make one more statement now. It kind of seamlessly supports where uh, IoT evolution. So why it is seamless? Uh, I'll come to that. Okay. So let me let me quickly discuss the uh, 5G coverage aspects. Now, why it is seamless? I'll come to that in three to four slides from now. So now we know that LTE had certain amount of coverage uh, with my geo hotspot. I get coverage in so many places. So you make you would have made such statements, right? So already LTE has very good broadband. So what else does 5G broadband do? That will be your question, right? <clears throat> 4G already with 4G, I'm able to see 4K videos on my mobile. What else can 5G do? Can somebody give me an example? We can connect to many devices. We can have more number of devices. Yes. Uh, in, in terms of per se, like uh, I gave you an example, right? So. Let's say 4G, you can watch 4K videos. 5G, where it can help you? Let's say one user is there. Only one user is there. Right now, sir, at, at, uh, sir uh, while fast moving vehicles at a speed of 500 kilometers, also browsing speed, that means uh, without any latency. Minimum okay. latency, we can get the data. Yeah, yeah. So it supports higher mobility. That is, if 4G can support a high speed train sort of scenario where you are moving at 300 kilometers per hour, maybe 5G can support you, uh, you moving at even 400 to 450 kilometers per hour. Yes, that is one thing. Also, maybe you are able to see 4K videos now. And but when you take to video conferencing, at best it will support some HD video conferencing, right? Your current 4G network. If, if you do video conferencing with two of your friends, let's say, it will support at best HD video conferencing. Four, 5G can support 4K video conferencing basically. Your two other friends can also be in 4K. Okay, so the amount of data that it supports is really huge compared to 4G. 
that is one aspect uh, second aspect is uh, that is in terms of broadband and as i told it can support lot of iot uh, devices okay now this is one question which i always ask in any 5g talk does 5g always mean millimeter wave because we have been talking about 5g many of them think that i get all these increased data rate because i have moved to millimeter wave bands is that correct 5g is always millimeter wave yes of course sir uh, it is required i think the millimeter band was only that's why that uh, then we can uh, say yes you can achieve more yeah, uh, bandwidth i think yeah, that's the Extra basic bandwidth we can yeah yeah sure but please remember millimeter wave is a part of 5g so millimeter wave is a subset of 5g okay but 5g does not mean millimeter wave 5g can also operate in your current lte regimes okay in fact even in india when we are bringing out 5g we are first trying to put 5g in the normal lte bands okay so millimeter wave is a big subset of 5g okay you can think of as two circles 5g is a big circle millimeter wave is a small circle within 5g but that small circle is occupying 75% you can tell like that but that remaining 25% is still there right that there many other 5g technologies exist in fact millimeter wave is not even 75% strictly speaking it's mostly 50% at best okay so there are a lot of 5g solutions which need not be millimeter wave so but again when we say the transformation from uh, this lte to 5g then purely uh, pure 5g network will again required this uh, millimeter wave no. only na once the yeah not necessarily not necessarily so millimeter wave is optional uh, for example uh, the current network which uh, jio is trying to bring out as the 5g network it is operating in sub 6 gigahertz band that is the normal lte bands which we are uh, using right now so millimeter wave they will install additionally for some indoor enhancement and so on that is a different thing altogether if you look at the cellular that's why, why uh, i just ask you that uh, when we have the 2g network then we are deploying some uh, uh, node b and then we are saying that yes now this is equivalent to 3g it means the 5g technology which we are pro projecting in our india mm -hmm. it will be not the pure 5g technology no 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 i'm sorry see it's still the what i don't know what you call as pure okay it is a 5g technology because it requires new hardware new infrastructure altogether Okay, that's it. But you that just uh, you just said now we require we have to introduce some additional node with the existing node. Then the uh, the no the no you are saying uh, I'm sorry you just confused my statement. My statement is this: 5G can come without millimeter wave also. You cannot tell that is not okay. novel because you have a 5G solution. It's operating in sub six gigahertz band. I'll use a term now which I'll explain later. Even in sub six gigahertz, I can do massive MIMO. Isn't massive MIMO a 5G feature? LTE yes. cannot do massive MIMO, right? So I can do a 5G massive MIMO solution with without millimeter wave. I can use massive MIMO in sub six gigahertz. So that is what Reliance is trying to bring out. Now they are trying to use sub six gigahertz band. deploy 5g but infrastructure that is the part of coding and all but uh, as far as the channelization is concerned then of course we required the millimeter waves no 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 not at all you can have the entire 5g nr standard working only in sub 6 gigahertz band nobody is stopping you this is the exact misunderstanding i want to get rid of from the 5g talk that's why i said this is my favorite question because many of them because it's it's simple when you google for 5g right every page you get yeah. will mention about millimeter wave yes when you google for 5g but that is the main thing yes, yes. as technical experts in 5g etc or as people in that domain we should be clearly knowing what it exactly means so yes millimeter wave is a big part of 5g nobody is denying that but the opposite is not true if something is not millimeter wave can it still be 5g definitely it can be 5g okay as long as it supports some other 5g feature such as say massive mimo or it follows the 5g nr standard so this 5g nr standard which i am talking about today right it is not restricted to only millimeter waves it can operate even in your existing current existing sub 6 gigahertz bands so one general question i would like to ask if you allow sure. please 
Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, my my question is like uh, when we have the two Mbps dedicated speed for every user, then mm -hmm. there is no such buffering and all, and audio quality is also very good. But uh, you, you just told me that uh, we we are uh, in 4G, 5G, and the coming generation we are expecting the 4K and videos. But uh, yeah. see uh, the human uh, because these all systems are made for humans, and humans' capabilities are enough to. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a very low res resolution images and this, you know, not HD kind of sides, uh, sound is required for mm -hmm. uh, recognizing some individual persons. So, what is the ultimate uh, utility behind me besides this uh, uh, mm -hmm. for humans? What else would be the future sure. of this generation? That is the thing. I think we are all from the same generation, so we feel like this. You should talk to some younger generation people. They will tell you that playing PUBG in 4G is very difficult. Okay, <laughs> okay. I think you got the example now, right? So it gives yeah. lot of interactive gaming abilities. So I see again. I am from a, your sort of generation, so I gave video video conferencing as an example. You talk to our students here or any others, they will play all these uh, grouped games, right? Where uh, three people teams, four I'm people teams. I'm not aware of it. That's the thing. Even I am not aware of most of these <laughs> games. But it is like basically, it's like this. All three users will be seeing the same screen seamlessly without any delay. It's like group attack. One guy tells you attack from this side, another guy tells. So three people they will coordinate and uh, solve a problem, solve the game basically. So they should not experience even a microsecond lag. Otherwise okay. they can't, they will not able to uh, kill that demon or whatever. I don't know some <laughs> game. Okay? okay. So all these interactive games and uh, even I I mean that is. From the entertainment point of view, from the non-entertainment side also, there are few things like uh, tactile internet. That is, for example, your vehicle breaks down. Okay, you go there and you should be able to provide like a high-quality service because what happens is, see, now you need a proper mechanic to correct it. What if you can send very high-resolution videos right up to the bolt and all these things, so that somebody sitting at the network can tell. Go change this here. Your problem will get fixed. So now that needs a high resolution image or a high resolution video, right? So otherwise, for human, I think it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah. Much otherwise, important. it becomes. When we difficult. say machine to machine or some group uh, group processing, parallel processing kind of things, then yeah. this network will be more useful. Yeah. That, that okay, thank true. you so much. It's mostly for cooperative purposes. So if I want to, if you want yes. me to put it that way. For any cooperative related tasks, enhanced data rate is a boon because now, like as again, LT was designed to uh, maximize single user data rates. So when you have lot of users and they want to cooperate and all, that's where a bigger pipe will help, basically. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Okay. So now, so hope now everybody is clear that 5G need not mean always millimeter wave. And 5G can be deployed in less than 6 gigahertz bandwidth. So see this. This was one statement which was made throughout the 5G congresses in the world. So UK, USA, even India, many of them participated in where should we deploy 5G. Many of them decided before we try anything in millimeter wave band, let's first try it in 3.7 to 4.2, something around that, that region. Okay. So that's why. People started exploring 3.5 gigahertz band, and they are even trying to put 5G on 600 megahertz band, which is your GSM band. Okay. Now, what they are trying to put on 600 megahertz band is not your broadband 5G. It's this IoT 5G, which is MMTC or URLLC, mostly MMTC. Okay. So the 600 megahertz band, they are trying to put all your MMTC services. Why? Because the data rate required is low. However, you need to support a lot of users. How they do support a lot of users is beyond the scope of this presentation. You might have heard many technologies like people may use Noma or they may use uh, uh, Massive MIMO. Massive MIMO I'll discuss a little bit, but uh, in terms of user access technologies, they may use different kind of Noma technologies or grant free access, which is my next session. So many technologies are there to support more number of users. But in terms of the operational band, 5G need not be there in the millimeter wave band. Okay. 
Now, what's the main advantage in terms of the bandwidth occupancy? See, if LTE has to give you 100 megahertz, currently it has to aggregate 520 megahertz channels. Okay, 5 into 20 is 100. So it has to aggregate so many channels, but every channel in LTE, every band in LTE has one megahertz guard band to the left and to the right. So in 20, you can use only 18. So if you want to use 100 megahertz in LTE, you will end up using only 90 megahertz. That is because LTE was designed for one band initially. Then they implemented carrier aggregation and now you are able to have multiple bands. However, 5G directly supports 100 megahertz and you can have up to 98 megahertz of data bandwidth with only one megahertz of guard bands. Okay, directly you can have 98 megahertz, but as much you cannot have in the sub 6 gigahertz bands. You cannot have it in 3.5 gigahertz or even 600 megahertz. For having such large bandwidths, you, you require millimeter wave. Okay, so if you want really high bandwidth, you can go to millimeter wave. Otherwise, if you want to have nominal bandwidth like 20, 40 and all, you can always deploy a 5G solution in the existing LTE bands itself. You need not move to millimeter wave bands at all. Okay. Next, I'll show you something called 5G is called a lean carrier. That is because if you look at the LTE transmission, this is the downlink transmission. Remember, we used to have those sporadic pilots reference signals, pilot signals spread out throughout the subframe. So when you transmit an LTE signal, this is how it looks like. This red thing is the broadcast. Blue thing is the synchronization signal, which comes every five milliseconds. Red is broadcast, which comes every 10 milliseconds and lot of pilot signals. Okay. Now in 5G, the synchronization and broadcast come once here and next 20 milliseconds, nothing. You won't even get any pilot symbols, nothing. You can directly use all of them for data. Okay. No pilot symbols come here at all. Now you may wonder, right? I told you the importance of pilots in LTE. There are no pilots only in 5G NR in the downlink. How will I even get my do my channel estimation? What saves the day? Basically, beam forming saves the day. Uh, I'll come to that soon. Maybe. Uh, okay, I think I don't have a specific slide on it, so I can just uh, tell it here itself. So what happens in 5G, unlike LTE is, uh, the base station has multiple antennas. Even the 5G users are expected to have more than one antenna. Okay, at least two antennas. Even for one antenna, it works, but at least two antennas. And then base station can have up to eight beams and user can also have up to three or four beams. It will find the best matching beam pair. Okay, that means when you do beam forming, what happens? Signal is directed towards you. And receiver side also, if you have beam forming, it's like you are benefited from both the ends. Transmit signal is also coming towards you. You have beam forming on the receiver side so that you maximize the SNR on the transmitted signal, on the received signal. So that way, this beam pair will get created and the channel is already good. So I need not estimate the channel very often. Unlike LTE, I can estimate the channel every 20 milliseconds, which is more than enough. Okay. And that estimation, I can use the synchronization signals itself to estimate the channel. I need not have special signals to estimate the channel again. So the beam forming aspect of 5G gives you advantage. Okay. In terms of estimating the channel or having a good channel condition for a long time. However, for 5G IoT, they can still be only single uh, antenna users. There, only one side beam forming can be done. That is the transmit beam forming. And for them, they may have to do better channel estimation. But the advantage they have is IoT need not send very high data rate, right? So even if they do some say slightly inferior channel estimation, they can adopt a very low code rate and send their signals so that it is still received by the base station. Okay. So that's why 5G is NR is called a lean carrier because the overhead is reduced very highly compared to the LTE. 
okay now coming to the third part and the biggest advantage i told you right in lte everything uses only one subcarrier spacing which is 15 kilohertz spacing however in nr you have lot of uh, flexibility for example if your bandwidth is up to 20 megahertz you can use 15 kilohertz spacing if your bandwidth is 100 megahertz you can go for 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing if your bandwidth is 200 megahertz you can go to 60 kilohertz subcarrier spacing for 400 megahertz you can go to 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing okay so the amount of subcarrier spacing you want to have changes as per your bandwidth okay now this one i think i'll just leave it as a uh, thought question for thought for you if somebody wants to answer they can feel free to answer uh, i won't be giving the final answer just to kindle some interest why are they increasing the subcarrier spacing as the bandwidth increases i mean why why i could have kept 15 kilohertz in 100 megahertz and had more number of subcarriers right what they are doing here is okay I increase my bandwidth, then I increase my subcarrier spacing also. Why should somebody do that? I, I, I ideally want to have a lot of subcarriers, right? So that I can send more and more data. Why are they increasing the width as the bandwidth increases? Think about it. If somebody wants to answer now, you can answer. I won't tell whether it's right or wrong. It will just give a hint to other people also. Then you can Google about it and maybe find out multiple reasons as why they are doing. There is no single reason why they are doing this. So can, does anyone want to take a guess? Question is very simple. Yeah. Sir, processing computation may be high. Okay, but when they, see, 5G devices I'm telling, I'm giving very good processors to them. So see if I'm giving 100 megahertz bandwidth, that means I also have power to process 100 megahertz bandwidth, right? Something as in, as in when they increase bandwidth, they are increasing the subcarrier spacing. Do, uh, it goes to the basics actually. Why do you need to give some spacing between subcarriers? Capacity can be no, no, not through the spacing, right? You do the spacing not to increase capacity. So one hint I'll give: think in terms of frequency offsets that can occur in the system. If your center frequency, that is, say you are operating at 2.4 gigahertz, if you are operating in normal LTE band, 2.1 gigahertz, you might be operating. However, if you move to millimeter wave band, you are operating at around 50 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz, right? So you all these are finally crystals, right? So I'll give this much hint, two, two more lines of hint, then you can figure out. Everyone is using some crystal for their clock, right? All these crystals have something called PPM error, parts per million error. So I think it's because, Naveen, to keep yeah. the fractional FFO to be constant, even though if you increase at least exactly. that is something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's to limit the amount of frequency offset, fractional frequency offset. That is because because every time you have a PPM, like say one PPM, if the crystal is there, if I yeah. operate it at two gigahertz, it will give me only two megahertz error. But yes, if I yes. operate the same crystal at uh, 60 gigahertz, then it will give me like 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz error. Yeah, so the jitter and the slip rate will be more, more yeah. pronounced when that case. More pronounced. So that has to get absorbed within your subcarrier, right? So that's why they keep increasing yes. the subcarrier spacing. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, just uh, yeah, earlier, see, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so that is. Uh, that is why they increase the subcarrier width. We got the answer today. Good. And same thing if I have to give some more numbers to it. So here I had told uh, macro coverage, small cell and so on. If I have to put some numbers to it, it's like this. So if you are operating in low frequency and your cell size is small, you can have these subcarrier spacings. So this is like a rule of thumb. So what happens is the numbers are given in the standard. But not every operator tends, see, since you can support any subcarrier spacing, you need some sort of a lookup table, right? 
for what kind of uh, cell sizes I should put uh, 15 kilohertz, for what kind of cell sizes I should put uh, 60 kilohertz like that. So what they are telling is, if the cell size is very large, then go for 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. If the size, cell size is medium, you can have 15 and 30. And if the cell size is small, you can have 15, 30 or 60. That is if you are operating at low frequencies. If you are operating at medium frequencies, it changes. Obviously, see, if I move higher in frequency, my cell size will reduce, right? That's why millimeter waves cannot cover a lot of distance. So if I go to very high frequencies such as millimeter wave, obviously I can't have a large cell or even a medium cell. I'll end up using a small cell, which is why I have to use a larger subcarrier spacing. So this is the uh, kind of uh, what rule of thumb that people use. OK. And uh, as I told, 5G is a very flexible framework. 5G NR is a very, very flexible framework. See, in the same frame, you remember the LTE frame, right? We used to give same type of service. Everyone used to get broadband service. However, see this NR frame. In the same frame, you can have a broadband. You can have vehicular. You can have MMTC. You can have NB-IoT. Multiple services can be supported. Even URLLC, multiple services can be supported within the same framework. And it's very intelligent. Look at this. URLLC means it should have very little delay, right? So it gives all the bandwidth to that user, but puts him only on one symbol. That way delay is small, but data is good, good enough. Right? See, URLLC is a thin strip. How, look at the mobile broadband. They are all wide and big, big rectangles, mobile broadband. Look at the MMTC. They are like horizontal rectangles. That is, amount of bandwidth they get is small. And amount of time symbols they get is also OK medium size okay so mass machine type communication can occupy this sort of grid broadband it used almost gives the entire bandwidth and some time symbols so like this it is literally packing a lot of things into one frame imagine the base station's complexity it has to decode all these things separately so it's it's lot of work for the base station so 5g they have worked typically like any communications engineer would have worked you are the most complexity is in the base station or base station has a lot of power with it. I can put a very good processor there. I can always make it powered up. I can put a big buffer there to queue up all the messages, etc. I'll push all the complexity to the base station. That's how they have mostly designed 5G. As a user, you just see the small rectangle for yourself. You are like, oh, I want to transmit in this small rectangle. I'll transmit. It's all base station's headache to go and decode you. Okay. So this is again one small beam forming example. If you remember in LTE, there is no beam forming. Synchronization signals used to come every five milliseconds. OK, but now look at this. Synchronization comes every 20 milliseconds. Not just that, every time it gets beam formed in a different direction. So now first when it comes, it is beam formed in this direction. Like uh, uh, almost clockwise, you will start from around uh, 270 degrees sort of thing and you will cover the entire 360 degrees. So each one will be beam formed in a different direction. So even the synchronization signals are beam formed. OK, it's not like only the. Uh, data is beam formed, even synchronization signals can be beam formed. OK. So that is why. Uh, I think I'll uh, skip the next slide because like how an LTE frame exists, NR frame exists. That's what I wanted to show. That's all in this. And I had put a TDD frame because LTE we had discussed mostly FTD frames. TDD frame will have a DL frame followed by a UL frame or it can have a mixture of both UL and DL. Nothing special about it. Let's move to the more interesting part, which is the beam forming part. See, this is how the entire powering up of, uh, happens. Do you remember that slide where we told what happens when the mobile device powers up? Similarly here, when it powers up, it first finds a good beam, not just finding the synchronization signals. It also has to find among these N beams, which one is good, which is its best match. It finds that, then it attempts random access, 
base station will tell okay i found you why don't you transmit your signal here and user transmits with that of course it has to share all its beam information everything with the ue so there is more messaging but all this will lead to a very good connection compared to an lte connection because of beam forming okay i mean so the yeah. uh, user equipment also will do the same thing like it will be also scanning the entire direction yeah if it has multiple antennas yes if it has more than one antenna it will scan like two antennas it has four beams so it can scan uh, four dire uh, four directions but okay uh, if it has a single antenna it won't scan uh, it it won't scan but it will scan only the transmit directions eight transmit directions will be there usually it will only look for which of the eight gave me the best snr so uh, navin could you please uh, say that about how the uh, number of directions related with the number of antennas how do you relate that oh yeah i mean i am not an antenna engineer but roughly it is like this i mean uh, it's like the result the, there is a formula for beam width versus number of antennas i don't recall ah, okay. the formula so basically if, if i have say a beam width of 40 degrees uh, i would ah. need need nine beams to cover my t60 degrees right if the beam uh, width is 45 degrees 40 okay degrees. okay 40 yes, into yes. 9 is 960 uh, 360 correct so yes. there, there is a relationship between beam width and the number of antennas that formula i don't remember okay uh, i will say that okay yeah that that will tell you basically that if you have say 16 antennas this is the beam width you can have uh, so what, see, then okay. then they can decide that i can have uh, so now they will have just have to find out to cover 360 degrees how many beams i require so that that thumb rule kind of a formula is irrespective of whether that is digital beam forming or analog beam forming is right it? right it's yes it's okay. irrespective of that so in practice what they do is if you have only digital beam forming even uh-huh. though your device is capable of say having a beam width of 20 degrees let's say very nice resolution you can you can have 20 degree beams but because you are using digital beam forming what they do is they combine two beams and call it one beam so that Uh, the losses of digital beam forming are covered up mm-hmm. okay did you get my point because if you had analog beam forming then you could have adjusted the phases such that each one is exactly 20 degrees apart but with digital beam forming we won't get such a nice resolution right i mean there will be some overlap between beams mm. so for that what they do is they have increased beam width though their device can support 20 degrees they actually tell we will do 30 degree beams and that 10 degree will be overlapping as in your first beam and second beam have an overlapping region of 10 degrees mm-hmm. okay so so a user can either detect your first beam or detect your second beam if he is in that overlapping region okay that is fine because you are still being served in some way or the other okay yeah okay so sometimes typically they don't want to make these beams extremely orthogonal because they may feel that there might be a very small null 1 degree sort of null and if your user is there in that null he won't get that beam at all yes yes okay okay so that's why they typically try to overlap the beams i mean i didn't go into so much details because it will okay. make it confusing so yeah thanks thanks beams can go be overlapped also okay okay so few more advantages by 10 minutes we should be ending the presentation and then we can show some demos uh so main advantage see main changes in nr as i told you the coding changes see they use ldpc codes for data channel and polar co- codes for control channel okay so they use uh, like there are two two kinds of ldpc two base graphs are there and these codes are called quasi cyclic codes that is if you take a code word and if you shift it by s times right shift the code word by s times so code word is a bit pattern something 011011 whatever if i shift it by some s number of times that will also be another code word so i think in the standard they support doubly cycle doubly circulant or even four circulant code words that is if you shift it by two times it becomes another code word okay so code words can be generated very easily just through shifting and it supports something called full irhrq so irhrq means incremental redundancy hrq this is required because when you might not uh, your signal may not, not get decoded at the first attempt so you you will store the uh, likelihood ratios for the first attempt 
that is the demodulation result for the first attempt then when the second one comes you don't get the demodulation res uh, result of the same signal as the first one because you will have channel coding and all first time you might have received information bits next time you can receive only parity bits but i can use that and still do the decoding okay so previously in lte even irhrq is there but every time they keep sending the information bit itself so they very rarely they send only the parity bits so that you can append it to information bits and decode that is supported in lte but in 5g it is fully supported as in if i want to send some say 16 bits of information let's assume that uh, after channel coding 16 bits became 48 bits that is i added 32 parity bits every time i can send only 16 so first time i sent the first 16 information next time i can even send the first 16 parity bits i need not send the information again because this irhrq will take care of decoding the signal okay and uh, similarly you can have a lot of hardware has improved leaps and bounds you can do a lot of things in parallel uh, also for control channel they saw that uh, polar codes they can be decoded with lower complexity than convolutional codes under certain cases and they are very short codes so that way you won't waste too much space sending the control signals uh, i didn't i'm not going to into details of these codes uh, that itself requires a completely different talk like this entire slide can be made a one hour talk where we can go into specifics of what kind of polar code is used how it is beneficial and so on uh, all you need to know right now is for data they use ldpc codes and for control they use polar codes and then the biggest feature of 5g is this massive mimo where you have at least eight or more antennas at the base station sometimes you can even have eight antennas at the ue because if it's a millimeter wave ue you can install eight antennas in a very short uh, die size basically so that's why uh, eight antennas are possible both at the base station and the receiver and with massive MIMO see again it has two advantages if it is below six giga above six gigahertz you, you can have very good beam forming and if you have uh, deployed it in below six gigahertz you can have very good spatial multiplexing that is on each beam you can allocate different users and so on you can increase the number of users and hence increase the capacity and in the millimeter wave region with beam forming obviously you can improve the range that is you can improve the coverage because you are directing your signals that is the biggest advantage of having massive MIMO so I you always have such slides like why now why didn't they do it before like LTE also supported MIMO. Why didn't you just change LTE? In LTE itself, why didn't you brute force massive MIMO? That is because, again, the hardware improved leaps and bounds. And uh, typically, mostly right now, massive MIMO is being used for coverage improvement, which is in millimeter wave. Uh, slowly, they are bringing in into the capacity improvement below 6 gigahertz. So that is why, remember, even LTE is evolving. So it does not mean that. 5G came so people will stop evolving LTE. LTE still keeps evolving. Slowly, LTE is also trying to absorb massive MIMO into it. Right now, I think LTE already supports eight. Uh, they have proposals to support 16 and 32 antennas. So in 5G, of course, you can support up to 256 antennas. Uh, but uh, if you are still deploying it in LTE bands, I don't think you will have 256 antennas and all. You will mostly have 64 antennas at best. So even in LTE, they are trying to support massive MIMO now. But remember that, uh, again, when people are designing hardware for 5G, they are making it more optimal. Now, if I have to put massive MIMO on existing LTE hardware, hardware will limit me at some place. You will have to change the hardware. Then people will think, if I'm changing the hardware, why do I stick to LTE? I'll change to a 5G solution itself. So that is why it is now. Now, because 5G has a standard support for millimeter wave, so massive MIMO can be used for coverage and hardware is improved for the non-massive MIMO applications. That's why there also I can use massive MIMO. So that was what was covered in this, both the slides. I'll share this material with the Professor Neil Kenton. He will share it with you so that you can read it at your convenience. Uh, yes, definitely. I will upload in the team's account. So all of them will be able to download in a single platform. Sure, sure. Yeah. So this is the last slide. So if you want to read about the specifications, 
these are the documents there are many technical specifications these will give you information about uh, lte 5g many things okay many, you will see a lot of it's very difficult to understand them initially but as i told you most of you will not work on all the channels like i think none of you will work on all the channels you will pick some channel data channel or random access channel or paging channel some channel you will pick and try to do research or try to come up with some new solution there okay so that particular channel after you understand it from all your googling and white papers etc always go through these specs initially you might find it difficult but once you have some understanding it will you can easily uh, understand and comprehend these things better and of course if you have any doubts you can always mail me i i'll share this along with my email id so that uh, if you have any doubts in the specifications what this means i'll be more than happy to answer okay so this is the entire overview of nr now in the next 20 minutes or so we will see how you can use matlab to uh, basically realize some of these channels okay it's very easy it's mostly indicative right okay so i'll show, show you only two three channels the matlab toolbox is very good you have a lot of channels there you can go and explore more channels once you know all these terminology so without me telling you all this terminology you wouldn't have understood if i showed any demo basically so now that you know all this terminology demo becomes very easy you can understand the demo within two three minutes so i will share my screen shortly i am opening matlab Uh, it is. Meanwhile, we can take some questions as uh, MATLAB may take one or two minutes to start. Yeah, let's see. Would you like to ask something? No. We, we have some. Well, oh, I, let's see your hand. You have raised your hand. If you would like to ask something, you can ask. Angadesh Kumar also. Uh, Sir, in 5G, each beam will be connected to What is it actually? Can you explain that? Each beam is connected to what? Single device or uh, single device means a handset. Ah, okay, okay. So there is no rule that on each beam there has to be a device connected because it depends on your device location also, right? So typically what happens is uh, device will find out where my which is the beam pair which is best for me and try to lock into that beam so i mean let's take a very simple scenario where there are only two users one user is present at 45 degrees another user is present at uh, minus 45 degrees but i will have a beam which is uh, sending things over all 360 degrees right but uh, the user will get connected to only yeah, the 45 degree the beam and the minus 45 degree beam if it is line of sight it all changes if there are scatterers. So that is one more very interesting part in wireless communication. You think the user is logged into 45 degree beam because he is at 45 degree. But in reality, it might be a user who is at some 120 degree. Because of scattering, he is receiving that 45 degree beam. Okay, But we need not know all those. For us, as long as a user is locking into the beam which is giving him highest SNR, I am happy. I need not care whether he is located exactly at 120 or exactly at 45. As long as he is able to get my signal through some beam, I'm, I should be able to provide him service. Sir, uh, suppose uh, if two users are in same 45 degrees, uh, my question is single beam can accommodate uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, both the users? Uh, it can, it can. Definitely it can. Uh, as long as the the bandwidth right see beam beam is a special thing that is common to both the users but bandwidth i can share no that is say 20 megahertz i can give to user one 20 megahertz i can give to user two that way both of them will get service good enough service okay, okay. You're not sure okay. About thank you right? yeah. oh, okay so i think let me share my screen again
so are you able to see my uh, matlab matlab application yes sir yeah it's visible now okay great so i'll show you where i got this from later so this is that ss block beam sweeping example i told you know even for synchronization signals they don't come as a omnidirectional signal even they, those come as beams and uh, the ue locks into one of those beams so see this is a matlab inbuilt code okay i have not written this code uh, so, sorry to interrupt so yeah. uh, just one suppose if when we imagine a beam from the base station to the user where the uh, elevation of the base stations are higher and users are like beams are in the downward direction isn't it correct right right so so then why do we have to think about for example when we say the angle from 0 to 180 with respect to what is the horizon to measure the angle how to interpret yeah, yeah. okay okay good thanks thanks for that question so whenever i have told right now about beam forming i am visualizing it in 2d plane that is okay. only the horizontal plane but as you told there will be an elevation base station has an elevation and there is this vertical component also so in reality your beam is a 3d thing it okay. has both the azimuthal and the elevation both it has right so uh, there also i can finally it's like translating from uh, 2d plane to 3d plane you can optimize parameters for both uh, increasing the say uh, beam width in the horizontal direction and increasing it in the vertical direction or balancing between them so that way yes uh, you can have both um, and also in very much in reality right none of the say, ues will be having line of sight path except yeah. in case of millimeter wave because millimeter wave range is very small you tend to rely on the line of sight path but uh, our normal uh, say sub 6 gigahertz no no one will have line of sight so that is what this example shows actually your user is somewhere and your base station is somewhere the beam pair it is locking to is based on the scatterer rather than the user location okay so so this is that simple example which is in 2d plane not the 3d plane 3d okay okay yeah so it's a 2d plane example where i have put uh, maybe i'll just run it i mean i'll give you the interpretation of this the code is very easy actually okay they have a lot of comments there so i need not explain too much so they just create the 5g nr ss bursts eight in eight different directions they send the burst so this is the thing this is what we remember right every we have every 20 millisecond this ss burst is there they send it in lot of directions and look at this this is the most interesting figure see this is where your transmitter is sending your transmitter is uh, basically located somewhere here at the origin very close to the origin your user is located here see the angle is roughly around uh, 30 degrees or 35 degrees look at which beam it has locked into it has locked into this beam which is kind of pointing towards 135 degrees it has locked into this beam and this beam that is because this beam went got scattered came to the user here so this became so this this is a scatterer in the environment something some reflective surface you can think it has bounced off a window or something like that so look at see i would be expecting that there is a downward looking 45 degree or 30 degree beam from the user which will connect with this transmission beam that hasn't happened at all it has locked into where the scatterer is there because that's how multipath works so now for this base station this guy thinks that the user is at some other angle some 70 degree angle or whatever but in reality the user is at 30 degree angle but it doesn't matter because this beam pairing has happened very well so i hope everyone was able to see this green and orange beams green is the transmitted beam this is going in some particular direction out of the eight one of them we are showing here and orange is the receive beam why the receive beam has more width because ue has very less number of antennas compared to base station so base station beams are wider as well narrower ue beams are larger but irrespective of the ue location it got locked into the direction from which the signal is coming the direction from which the snr is the best so that's where it gets locked into and ideally this is what we want we don't require the perfect angles we need to find out that 
this is the direction in which he is receiving because channel can also change the phase of your signal right so this is so let me just a minute yeah. so uh, if i correctly understand let me say so when we say the transmit and receive beam forming so in reality that is not something like two beams are looking at each other so yeah yeah right in so, reality they might not be exactly looking at each other in an los way it's yeah. like this is the best pair which will give you the maximum snr okay so meaning that that channel behaves in such a way that transmitted signal is going in a particular direction yeah. receiver is looking at a particular direction in the space to capture in the best way exactly exactly so that now, is how we have to enter okay yes yes so that is why i tell your visual angle will be entirely different from your signal reception angle okay we might have seen this even it with our homes right like if you had some old tv sets with two antennas and all we hmm. like some for some people will tell you point it in this direction it will get better signal and yeah. you would have thought like why like i know that my tv tower is uh, in this direction like especially in small cities or say towns like darwad here radio stations i know where, where is my radio tower i can see it from my terrace but if i point my antenna to the direction of the radio tower i won't get anything okay okay there might be some scatterer somewhere so if i point it slightly off right some 20 degree off i'll get very good signal mm -hmm. that is because you see that is the thing that is the way receivers work they try to find out which is the best snr they i mean physically they don't know that i am at 20 degree or 40 degree right yeah yeah so it it is like as you told it is sensitive to the channel where the channel is putting your signal in which direction your channel is putting your signal mm -hmm. in fact that is what is decided like if we do conventional wireless communication where we say i represent channel as a matrix derive the eigen values and eigen vectors yeah. direction of the eigen vectors is the direction of the channel right yeah where most of the powers reside most of the power yeah yeah so that's where our beam forming is also trying to find that in fact that's why they end up getting the logging to the eigen vectors of the channel itself so it is always true that for the channel the best transmit side is the right uh, transmit receiver side is the left and right singular vectors so can we interpret yeah, that yeah yeah. yeah yeah it becomes like that actually okay all it it turns out to be like that always that is always thing, right? okay. okay yeah so what happens is this see conventionally when you didn't have any beam forming you had no way to realize this left and right singular vectors right yes with this beam forming you are providing a virtual means to get closer to those vectors so yes. i would not say it will be exactly that vector but it will be a thing it will be another vector which will be very close to that vector okay mm -hmm. uh, uh, strictly speaking if there are say n such vectors possible and if i take the norm square error norm with the left and right singular vectors this will be the ones with the lowest norm okay okay yes th thanks ramesh yeah thank you please go okay so like this see here they have shown the 3d pattern also so see that is uh, i am just showing you figures because once you see the code you will understand very easily how to interpret these things this is the question you had asked like in 3d how the directivity looks like so this is the power they have different so it's minus 40 dbi to 5 dbi so lot of power is being radiated in this direction you can rotate it and see and all i have disabled that rotation as of now so see so so here they have given some numbers so that you understand where this this is like azimuthal 90 degrees Uh, elevation 90 degree we are not sending any signal see it's in a null almost azimuthal 90 degrees you are sending this beam here and so on so like this you can find out lot of things so uh, the way to get to these is very simple you should have matlab uh, from uh, 2020 b but i would recommend anything from 2021 a also so 2020 b is minimal 2020 a is minimal and uh, 2021 if you have definitely you will have this just search for 5d toolbox okay you have lot of these examples so i'll i i'll show you one more demo that see so if you go to 5g toolbox just click this every example is there many uplink channels many downlink channels sub components of physical layer end to end simulation system level simulation you have examples for all these 
and they will tell you that this is how like I'll go for some end to end simulation. Let's say for uh, uh, transmission over a MIMO channel, something like this. There is an option to open live script and run this. OK, so if I click open live script, it will open in MATLAB live. See, it will open it like this in MATLAB and you can run this entire thing. And they have a lot of good comments. They even tell which standard documents they have taken it from. And see, these are all standard. Uh, you have when, whenever 5G says, see, 4G used to accommodate these channel models like extended pedestrian, vehicular model, etc. In uh, 5G, they are called tap delay lines. There is something called TDL models. So this will provide you all the channel models to test your signals, everything. So you need not develop most of your things. Like if you are developing a novel solution, you just need to develop that novel solution. All the other framework MATLAB provides you for free if you have the 5G toolbox installed. And if you have academic MATLAB license, 5G toolbox comes with your academic MATLAB license. So you need not do anything extra. You just have to install this toolbox. And for anything related to antenna, you need the phased array toolbox also. Okay. So Ravi, can we edit this code and then we can add our own algorithms in the snippet and then yeah, can... yeah, you can do that. It won't edit, let you edit this file. You can no. copy all this content to another file and edit. Okay. So sometimes it will complain that some sub function is mixing, but then you can again get that sub function and copy it back to your folder. Okay. So, so that way, but only problem is uh, not all files are editable. Some are mix files. That is the some algorithms they don't want to reveal, such as say LB, LDPC decoding. Uh -huh, so okay. they would have made it an executable only. So you can't edit the way LDPC gets decoded, but if you give a signal, it will decode it. Hmm. Okay. So these are the main uh, takeaways. So I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if somebody expected like one and a half hour of demo because it, it's not feasible to give any such demo. If you know all the concepts, reading these demo MATLAB files will become very easy. So it's like this is one example to generate the NR uplink signal. So see, this will just generate. You have to set here. This is my bandwidth. This is my subcarrier spacing C15, cyclic prefix normal, a bandwidth in terms of PRBs, 25 PRBs. So other or I can have another instance where I can have 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Like this, I can choose my configuration. And once I choose, I have to choose what modulation I want to send, QPSK. And this is how the uh, information is sent. Remember, I told you. There, let's say there are 48 bits, you get 16 bits now, 16 bits later and so on. What order you have to get? Each one is let's say K bits, first K bits, then instead of sending the next K, it will send the third K bits, fourth K bits and so on. The order in which your information is sent. That is called the RV sequence, number of antenna ports. All this you can configure and then you can, there will be just uh, one or two lines of code to generate the waveform. See, there is an inbuilt function called waveform generator. You just have to configure all these settings, give it to the waveform generator, it will generate you an uplink waveform. So now like how Professor Neil Kanton asked, like if I want to change, I, I, I have to give a config which is supported by the standard. This supports all configs which are supported by the standard. As long as your configuration is supporting the standard, it will generate you the waveform, which is anyway good for you because you might be thinking, right, I have developed a solution. Is it NR compliant? So you feed your parameters here. If it can generate the waveform with your parameters, that means it is NR compliant. So that way you can check whether your, uh, whatever settings you are using, it is compatible with the NR standard. See, it generates this time frequency grid. <coughs> These are the different power levels, that's all. So this is all different uh, user data going in. Maybe some user is 30 megahertz spaced. So remember I told you 5G frame can have both 15 megahertz, 30 megahertz spacing and all. Here is one user using 15 megahertz spacing. Another user is using 30 megahertz spacing. Okay, so like this, you can generate a lot of data. So that was some time domain figure. And uh, more, more such uh, uh, examples are there. If you just go to the toolbox, lot of examples are there actually. So, 
so any specific channel you want to simulate let's say you want to simulate the downlink uh, data channel so you just go here see downlink physical signals physical channels transport channels downlink ofdm modulation all these are supported see so if i go to downlink physical channels same thing right pdsch these are all the internal functions to uh, simulate pdsch and if you look for examples and all it will tell you how to simulate pdsch see downlink waveform generation just like i did uplink waveform you can do downlink waveform downlink control signal processing all these many of them are already illustrated for you i my whole aim was to introduce you to all these channels and enable you to go to matlab and find out the various simulations because each one is working on something different somebody might be interested in uplink somebody is interested in data somebody in control for every one there is enough support in matlab 5g toolbox and same is true with lte toolbox there is also an lte toolbox in matlab so both these toolboxes are extremely helpful you can develop your solutions pick the channel models pick the way noise is added create a subframe etc just like how they do it in the channels and test it there then when you write papers or when you present your results you can say your solution is even standard compliant okay so any questions or any specific uh, channel you want to see the audience uh, do you have any particular question or something we can request uh, the speaker to elaborate on that i think they i feel that uh, they might be looking this toolbox and this uh, maybe yeah. for the first time many of them might be yeah yeah that is true that is why i actually didn't spend too yeah. much time on this i introduced them to 5g everything yeah yeah so, but if they install and see they will be even in the mathworks.in they right. also they will be able to see all the things in the documentation what is there yes definitely and again if they have any questions let them uh, mail to me i'll be more than happy to answer yeah so the, uh, i mean there is one question from the yeah audience so afsar uh, how to see bell hop acoustic channel in antlab how to see what uh, bell what is bell hop acoustic channel i am not even you, you, i am also unfortunately not familiar with that afsar uh, you can unmute if you want please raise your hand i can identify you and you can explain better from your side yeah uh, just a minute yeah ah, yes um, now officer you can unmute and speak yeah officer now you can speak you have to unmute from okay. your side i i muted right yeah you now i have enabled him so i think the channel that he is asking is uh, not for uh, 5g new radio it's it's mostly if i am uh, i mean radar i mean uh, it might be in radar or some other communication acoustic usually is used in underwater uh, so acoustic is usually used in underwater that is not supported in the 5g toolbox for that they have to install that radar or some other toolbox ah yes yes that is something but i've said you are i have enabled you you should be able to yeah you are enabled you should be able to speak uh, okay fine i think he has texted that so yeah as you are saying like that might be somewhat related to the acoustic channel but even i also not think about that i i i don't i can tell which toolbox it comes like uh, they, see there are some radar toolboxes in matlab like yeah. uh, radar and sonar toolboxes like how we have 5g new radio toolbox lte they also have radar and sonar bo toolboxes one of these will definitely contain that because uh, acoustic means uh, there will be mostly ultrasound so sonar mostly sonar so sonar will contain the uh, bell yes. hop channel there again it will be very similar to this there will be something called channel model you just have to go and change it there yes yes yeah maybe yeah sir uh, 
I, I will try to check maybe a, tomorrow let you know where, which toolbox is available then and i mean i will yeah. have a look at it sometime yeah uh, radar or sonar one of these two okay uh, okay so because Next. I know bellhop is a standard acoustic channel model. It's, it's like our relay fitting in underwater. It's Hello. a standard yeah. model. So I'm, okay. I'm sure they will be supporting it in some toolbox. Which one? I don't know that is. So meaning that uh, acoustic means in that uh, kilohertz band, that's a channel model they uh, incorrect yes, yes. for that. Yeah, yes. basically it's like uh, our relay fitting only, but uh, what our relay fitting does is uh, basically it has only, it, it gets derived from Gaussian random variables. This one, what happens is the uh, what I, the sub. It's like if you visualize OFDM subcarriers, the side peaks can become larger in the bellhop channel. So like it, it's like a sync pulse, but uh, in the sync pulse, the side peaks reduce very quickly. Side lobes, so it will have bigger side. Lobes. So okay, bellhop bellhop channel structure has larger side lobes. Okay. Uh, yes, Sanjay, you can go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, because simulation uh, is to be done by MATLAB for 5G. Right. Uh, so, uh, can we use uh, NS2, NS3? Which will be better option? Uh -huh. Okay, uh, that is a good question. So, whatever I showed was for the physical layer sort of work. Yeah. And some yeah. small amount of MAC layer work. If you want to do uh -huh. network, Hello. Hello. Yeah, I would suggest you to use uh, NS3 for network layer sort of work. Okay, sir. And sir, uh, uh, is there any similarity between NS2 and NS3 then? There are, but uh, what happens is, see, typically this IPv6 versus V4 things are there, right? Uh, yeah. But if previously networks were IPv4, then they changed it to IPv6. NS3 has hmm. better support for IPv6. I mean, as in, if you go, see, many of us borrow code from GitHub or Google, Google etc., to create yeah, yeah. the environment. So you will get very good proper codes for IPv6 if you go for NS3. NS3, yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. One more hint is you can borrow many things from WLAN. Okay. See, remember okay. one thing: uh, 5G's uh, all these pro protocols start from MAC and uh, physical layer. So in terms of network layer, lot of things are shared with even your Wi-Fi. Like TCP, UDP and all are very similar to Wi-Fi. So you can mm -hmm. use the support you have for Wi-Fi or w, WLAN in uh, NS3 and extend that to 5G. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I mean, what about the uh, 5G uh, package that comes with uh, NetSIM? So that's only meant for Mac and higher layers? Or? Yeah, mostly yes. I mean, see, they, see, networking in 5G is again TCP. Mm. So as long as you have your own TCP console, be it NetSIM, NS, whatever, as long as you, are, you have your own uh, TCP console uh, giving you packets, that fragmenting for the Mac layer is what we have to start from. Mm. So before that, it is actually agnostic to the technology. I Once, like all the TCP and other things that I do know, I, I can I did not make it compatible with 5G as such. I can do it the regular way, but send it using 5G. Okay. But what what it can give you is like see uh, 4G LTE can support some packet size, let's say 1024 bits. Maybe 5G can support a higher packet size. So only that change is required. That is you can have bigger packets sent. Other than that, generation mechanism and all nothing will change. Like if you have NetSIM or NS generating TCP packets using some VBull distribution or something, right, to mimic uh, traffic arrival, you can continue using that. You can adjust the packet sizes such that it is compatible with 5G. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the participants? Yeah, I think okay. So okay. yes, I mean I think there are no more questions. In fact, it was really interesting. You have covered the all the practical aspects and how to explore several things. 
So, so thank you. Even yeah, several complicated things were explained very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, next one is my next session is little more specific though. Uh, grand prix access does have little bit of math and it is little more specific. Yeah. But uh, and there also I'll try to cover the big picture. Uh, let's see how that also goes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, I think no other questions from their side. Yeah. Okay, then thank you, Navin. Then we will meet tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. again. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to another good session from you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Oh, Sabida, I think uh, just you raised your hand. So if you have any questions, you can unmute and ask. Hello. Uh, sir, Hi, yes. uh, we wish to access the materials, sir. In Teams, it's not possible to access from uh, other mail ladies. Ah, yes, yes. If, if, if at all you have to get access to the materials, you should log in with the user ID provider to you. User ID provided. Okay. Ah, yes. So you can just for joining the session, you can join with any ID. That doesn't matter. Just you click the link that will let you in. Okay, sir. Since okay. I have enabled all of them to uh, come and join the yeah. meeting, meaning that it should be restricted within the organization. So with IIT Goa domain only, it will allow. Since many okay. of our participants facing the problem, I have told the system has been to five days to allow other guests also to use the MS Teams. However, you will not be able to get the drive, meaning that um, you cannot access to the recordings and the uh, files in the portal. We that have to interpret the login from the domain ID. From the domain ID, it's mailed to us. Yeah, and we might have received probably if, uh, if whatever the email you have given, so they might have added the FTP prefix to that and sent you a, a, a given Gmail ID there. Okay, okay. Sir. So with the user ID password, if you join, you can see everything on the left tab. Immediately, right. it will show you you are part of the Atal FTP uh, teams. So, all the files will be you can access in the single port. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, yeah, okay. So, any other questions from the participant side? If not, if you don't have any other questions, you can leave. If you want to ask something or clarify, you stay back, else you can leave.